You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is February 17, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, ABAS Chapter 7, Immune Receptors and Signal Transduction. Our presenter is Dr. Nikita Raji. She's the Chief of the Section of Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Chapter 7 today, we kind of switched around the chapter numbers this time, so you already went through chapter 8, and now we're going to be talking about chapter 7 and boss. Ready, guys? Okay, all right. Talk about um, immune uh, immune receptors and signal transmission. So now this uh, objectives are to then understanding about TCR signaling, BCR signaling, cytokine signaling. Each of the following is an example of GPCR or G protein coupled receptor. And then in this in T cell calcium signaling pathway induced by antigen recognition, which enzyme and transcription factor are activated? All right, welcome back to this. Let's talk about signaling phases. So signaling is a uh, process that occurs after receptor and ligand interaction. So the receptor ligand interaction is the first phase of that signaling. The next phase, uh, the receptor and ligand is um, is the first phase, and then the second one is cytosolic phase, which means there are signaling molecules that do their job in the cytoplasm. And then the third one is the nuclear phase. So here's the process where the ligand is binding to the receptor. Once it's bound in the in the cytoplasm, there are signaling molecules that interact with each other. And then the third part is one of those um, molecules um, called transcription factor is modified, and that moves on into the nucleus. And then it binds to the promoter region, or um, um, and it basically modulates the transcription of some target genes. Right. So that's the basis of um, signaling and receptor ligand binding. So um, there are some exceptions. In some, there is no transcription, and then there are other kinds of um, effects that occur be uh, because of that receptor and ligand interaction, and that could be related to cell motility, granular exocytosis, apoptosis, or protection from cell death. So any of those can occur. But when we are talking about immune receptors, we are going to focus on this transcription of target genes because that's our um, goal of understanding how T cells or B cells or cytokines signal. So let's talk about the first phase. So for the receptors, either there are cell surface receptors or nuclear receptors. The cell surface receptors bind cell bound or soluble uh, ligands, and then nuclear receptors bind to lipid soluble ligands. Once that receptor ligand interaction occurs, there is a new geometric shape creation, which means, say, if these uh, surface receptors bind to their ligand, there might be several ligands that bind to several of those receptors on the same cell and kind of bring those all those receptors together to uh, to make a process called cross-linking. So all those receptors are cross-linked, and that changes the, um, the geometric shape that in the cytoplasmic side. So that, that part that changes the shape is the one that uh, initiates the signaling. Or there might be conformational change. So there might be some kind of epitope that's created that there might be change in that um, shape. So all right. So once that happens, the receptor and ligand interact, there, is, uh, there are changes that occur in, this, in the cytoplasmic molecules, called signaling molecules. And so there can be different kinds of mo um, molecules that take part in it. So there are different kinds of receptors, type of receptors, uh, that um, decide what kind of interaction takes place. 
One of the example is kinases. So there are protein kinases or uh, amino acid kinases, different kind of, kind of kinases that take part in the signaling. And the function of a kinase is to add phosphate, mole phosphate moiety or molecule to any kind of other uh, molecule or cytoplasmic tails of the uh, receptors. So phosphorylation is one type of uh, process that occurs. The other one is dephosphorylation. So instead of kinases, there are phosphatases that take away the phosphate moiety from that molecule. The other processes are ubiquination, acetylation, or methylation that take place for the receptor. So there are different kinds of receptors based on where that tyrosine kinase or the kinase is. So tyrosine kinase basically adds phosphate to the tyrosine in the receptor or in any kind of signaling molecule. And we'll talk more about that. But if there is a phosphate added, that means it's a kinase. And if a phosphate is taken away, it's a phosphatase enzyme, right? So that kinase plays a, it, it plays a very important role, but that kinase can be at different places. So here is a receptor, the first one, that itself doesn't have the kinase property. So it cannot, even though it can bind to the ligand, it cannot add a phosphate molecule where it needs to be. So for that, there is a non-receptor tyrosine kinase that's closer to the receptor that takes part. So that's called a non-receptor tyrosine kinase-based receptor. On the other hand, there are receptors that the cytoplasmic tail itself has the kinase property in it. So the receptor itself is it's enough to bind to the ligand and then using its kinase property it can add phosphate to that molecule, to the receptor itself. And that would be the first step of signaling. All right. Um, then there are nuclear hormonal uh, uh, molecules that go to the, that crosses the nuclear membrane and then binds to the receptor or it binds to the receptor and then crosses the nucleus and then interacts with, the, um, uh, say, a promoter region of the gene or something like that to help with uh, transcription of that target gene. Then there are GPCR ligands, uh, or sorry, receptors. So G GPCR is a receptor that kind of uh, spans the membrane like seven times and then uses G protein or GTP um, uh, molecules for activation and signaling. And there is something called notch receptors, which means the way it binds, the, once the ligand binds to the receptor, it has, the receptor itself has two parts. One is the, um, the external part, uh, part of the receptor, and the part that bound to the cytoplasmic tail uh, has a notch. So basically, when the ligand binds to it, it clicks so that it's broken off, it cleaves, and that broken portion, the cytoplasmic tail, goes to the nucleus and then uh, modulates the transcription. So different types of receptors that use different processes for signaling as their first step. So we talked how kinases are important for immune uh, signaling. So kinases, I think, you know, overall, this is not something you're going to be tested on, but it's important to know that there are different ki kinds of kinases that take part in immune signaling. And they are almost like your Lego pieces, right? So Lego pieces come together to bind to each other. They have to fit exactly the, how they are supposed to. And once they are fit in each other, they kind of make a structure. And that's what happens. The receptor binds to the ligand, and then the different kinds of molecules come in contact with each other. They have to fit, fit perfectly to form a specific shape or specific chemical structure for it to function, and then produce the specific molecules or transcription factors that can bind to the enhancer or promoter region of the gene, um, of the uh, gene, so that the target gene is transcribed. Does that make sense? Just kind of keep that in mind. So the first molecule we are going to talk about is a kinase. There are different kinds of kinase. So remember, there are receptor uh, tyrosine kinase receptors, and then there are non-receptor tyrosine kinase. 
So there are different kinds of families of uh, tyrosine kinase based on their structure. So here there are uh, kinases called CERC family kinase or SIG family kinase and TEC family kinase. And there are different kinds of domains or like Lego pieces like that are important in that structure. So they are called SH2 domain or SH3 domain or pH domain and each of that takes part in uh, in how the signaling works or what kind of signaling takes place. So those are called domains. So each of this structure or a piece, Lego as I call it, is, uh, is called a domain. And then based on what kind of domains come together, there are different families of kinases. And what do kinases do? Add? Phosphate. phosphate. Okay. And then phosphatases are the other type that take away uh, phosphate. Then we talk about, so the, we talked about kinases, now we talk about adapter proteins. So there are different types of adapter proteins um, in the cytoplasm take, that take part in uh, signaling. And what do they do? They are basically a docking station. That means they just give a surface on which different kinds of molecules can come together, including some enzymes. They can bind to each other, and that those enzymes are important to uh, to give rise to specific proteins that take part in signaling. But the docking stations are, or sites are just a molecule that gives the surface on which those other enzymes can interact with their um, substrates. So something like LAT or um, GADS, SLIP76, all those are uh, different kinds of um, docking sites. So they can be membrane protein, like LAT, or they can be in the cytoplasm, like SLIP76. Again, they have specific domains. So domains are, remember, different kinds of pieces. So here is the SH2 domain or SH3 domain, um, different kinds of domains that come together to form that adapter protein. And so you have to remember that when we, talk, we are talking about adapter proteins or kinases, we are seeing the similar kinds of domains, right? The SH2, SH3, here is SH2, SH3 in the, uh, some of these adapter molecules because they interact with each other and they have to fit perfectly with each other to form those complexes. So now let's talk about the immune receptors, right? We were just talking about generally about different kinds of receptors and their uh, structures. Now we are going to talk about the immune receptors. So here is a BCR, here is a TCR, so B cell receptor, T cell receptor, some FC receptors, and then PD1. So different kinds of receptors, they have this structure that is repeating or immunoglobulin superfamily region. So they have the structure that is similar in the immunoglobulin that can keep on repeating in some of these receptors. And apart from the external surface that comes in contact with the ligand, there is a transmembrane signaling protein that has to go with it. So once the ligand binds to the, the receptor, because the cytoplasmic tail of some of these receptors is very small, they have a signaling um, protein that is uh, close to that receptor. So in, that, in case of BCR, it's IG-alpha and IG-beta. In case of TCR, it's three molecules and zeta chain. Similarly, FC uh, epsilon receptors have um, some signaling molecules close to it. FCR2B has um, some molecules, some molecules, uh, sorry, the cytoplasmic tail itself takes part in that signaling. So the tyrosine-containing motif in the cytoplasmic tail of these signaling molecules is the most important part of that signaling molecule. So that's called either ITAM, immunoreceptor activating motif, or inhibitory motif. So um, these ITAMs or ITAMs are in the cytoplasmic tails, and if it's an activating motif, it takes part in activation of that tire, uh, some of the molecules, and ITAM is the inhibitory um, motif. So the structure has, a, uh, has the tyrosine moiety uh, uh, in it. Along with that, there are other amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, valine, based on whether we are talking about items or items. So re remember, items are the ones that activate, items are the inhibitory ones. And these 
uh, signaling proteins are in close proximity with some of the kinases. So kinases, for example, tyrosine kinase is going to add phosphate to the tyrosine. Remember, this item or item has a tyrosine in it, right? This is the tyrosine in the structure of the item. That tyrosine is the one that, that so the phosphate is added to the tyrosine in that item. So the CERC family kinase adds a phosphate to this, but to do that, it has to be in close proximity to these signaling proteins. So, so there are several um, items in some of these chains, or there are one or two signaling uh, chains which have one uh, item in it. So those take part in the signaling. But when we talk about lymphocyte signaling, we are talking about signaling during their um, uh, development. So you talked about development last week, right? And during that development, you learned that how lymphocytes have to come in contact with, say, self-antigens and um, MHC molecules. And based on what they, how they interact, they are either going to be, uh, e they are either going to survive and develop further, or they are going to be killed. They are going to die, right? They are not going to uh, mature further. And so it's important to understand that the signal strength is different when they are maturing, and based on the signal strength that's that goes through when, when they bind to the self-antigen, they might be killed if they bind very tightly to those uh, uh, receptors. Versus um, if they don't interact at all, they are again going to be killed because they cannot interact with the MHC molecule. So it's important to understand that the uh, signaling strength can be different in dif different interactions. Once the T cell is completely mature, when they interact with an antigen, not a self-antigen, but antigen that it comes across and gets activated, again, the signal strength can be different. And so the thought is that the progressive item use helps in determining how strongly the signal is uh, it passes through that. So because these uh, cy uh, cytoplasmic chains have several items on it, for example, in TCR, or two in case of BCR, progressive item uh, activation can lead to increased signal strength based on how many items are, um, are used. Besides that, there are co-receptors and inhibitory receptors or co-stimulators, which means second signal, that take place uh, in that interaction along with the receptor and ligand interaction that play a role. So let's talk about the T cell receptor. So we know that the T cell receptor is in either alpha beta in alpha beta T cells or gamma, del gamma delta in case of gamma delta T cells. Besides that TCR, that TCR is, in, uh, is uh, in close proximity to the signaling uh, chains, and those are called CD3 molecules and zeta chains. So CD3 is either epsilon gamma or epsilon delta, and each of these chains have item in the cytoplasmic uh, tail of it. And then there are zeta chains. Each of the zeta chains has three uh, items in it. So together, every TCR has 10 items that it can use. This table basically just gives you an, um, a dif the differences between TCR and immunoglobulin receptors. So uh, we already kind of talked about this, but overall, if you think about it, the, in the external surface has binds to the ligand. So that has the variable domain and one constant domain that, uh, uh, that TCR has. And similarly, immunoglobulin um, receptor also has the heavy chain and light chains with the variable and constant domains. The number of hypervariable regions are pretty much similar. Signaling molecules are different, so CD3 and zeta chains in case of TCR. And in case of PCR, it's Ig alpha and Ig beta. Uh, their dissociation constants are different, so their affinity for the antigen is different. And then in case of T cells, they can pr produce secreted form of immunoglobulins um, whereas the TCR is attached to the T cell. It doesn't uh, release or secrete the, the TCR. 
there is no isotype switching or somatic hypermutation in case of TCR, which is present with PCR. Structure of TCR, we kind of looked at the, the structure in MHC molecules, right, where, is, where there is a beta-plated sheet uh, kind of a structure. And similar to that, so here is a MHC molecule. So we are talking about, say, CD8 here. The CD8 cell has the TCR with alpha and beta chains, uh, and then that interacts with uh, MHC class 1. So MHC class 1 has alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, along with the beta 2 microglobulin. So this is the structure of MHC. That interacts with the peptide chain with the TCR. That TCR has the variable region that interacts with that. So this is the outer region of the TCR. And that's the immunoglobulin domain, the same kind of uh, structure that's present in all immunoglobulin superfamily structures. Also, we talked about the TCR structure, the co-receptor, or CD4 or CD8 on the T cells has a specific structure. Again, you see that immunoglobulin domain in all of these. And then there is a cytoplasmic chain. In case of CD4, there is one chain, CD8 has two chains. What's important about this, now we are looking at two cells. Here is the APC, and here is a T cell. The TCR is the alpha-beta TCR that interacts with the MHC class 2, right? So this is a CD4 uh, cell. So CD4 cell has the alpha-beta TCR and has the CD4 co-receptor. So the TCR binds to the MHC-bound peptide. The CD4 also binds to the MHC molecule. And then there are different kinds, different items, so 10 items on the CD3 and zeta chains in proximity to that TCR. The CD4 molecule in the cytoplasmic tail, so here, has, is bound to a kinase called, uh, called LCK. So that's an important structure that's bound to the co-receptor, not to the receptor. So it's a because TCR is a non-receptor tyros uh, tyrosine kinase family, it doesn't have the tyrosine kinase in itself, but the co-receptor has the tyrosine kinase in its tail. So when the TCR and um, the APC interact, the so T cell and the APC interact, we think about it as an interaction between the receptor and the ligand. But in reality, there is a whole complex that's formed when that interaction between APC, here's the APC, and the T cell occurs. So yes, the TCR binds to the antigen. It, uh, it recognizes the antigen and is that's bound to the class 2 MHC, and that interacts with the TCR. But apart from that, there is inter interaction between the co-receptor with the MHC, there is interaction of the second uh, signal or the co-stimulators with their ligands. And apart from that, there is interaction between adhesion molecules. That's how those two cells stay together during that interaction. So uh, that might be integrins and integrin ligands interacting with each other. So that way, that whole complex is formed that's called supramolecular activation cluster, or SMAC. So that supramolecular activation cluster has two parts, central part and the peripheral part. Central part is where the TCR and the co-receptor co-stimulators are interacting. And then the peripheral part is where the adhesion molecules are interacting with each other. So remember that that part of the cells has um, a very unique structure made up of un uh, lipid rafts and glycolipid enriched microdomains. So they can move a little bit in that lipid with the lipid raft. So they can move around a little bit so that they can interact with the different molecules across the cell. What's the uh, function of this SMAC? Basically, it helps with the stable contact between the two cells. In case of T cell, uh, sorry, CD8 T cells, in, for example, it will help with delivery of granule cytokines between those two cells, so that those granules are not releasing into uh, extracellular space overall. And then some of these signaling molecules delivered to uh, to the endosome are for degradation, help to terminate the T cell activation. 
So that's the interaction between the T cells and the APCs. So that's, we were just talking about the receptor and ligand interaction here, right? So now once that receptor and ligand interaction in that central SMAC occurs, we talk about T cell signaling. So say it, it recognized the antigen, what happens next? So there is that receptor ligand binding, and then the end result or the purpose of that uh, binding is that that cell is activated. Once the T cell is activated, it undergoes clonal expansion, differentiation, it, uh, it makes the effector molecules, so that could be cytokines or cytokine, uh, cytotoxicity granules. And then also, once it's activated, it's important that that T cell survives longer. So it's important, one of the purpose of that binding of the ligand is to prolong the survival of that activated cell. So that occurs through signaling. So let's look at the, the details of that signaling. So once that receptor and ligand interact, there is some geometric formation, geometric shape formation, and that could be because of the cross-linking that occurs, uh, there, or there can be a conformational change that occurs that causes signaling molecules and enzymes to be activated. And that gives rise to transcription factor activation. Those transcription factors move to the nucleus, and in the nucleus bind to the promoter region or and increase the transcription or affect the transcription of target genes. Once those uh, genes are transcribed to mRNA, mRNA translates to protein, and that's how that cytokine is released. And that cytokine is, in effect, going to cause all these effects. So, I, For example, IL-2 uh, cytokine will cause T cell proliferation, Different, help with differentiation and prolong the uh, life of those T cells. So that's the purpose of that receptor ligand binding is to get to that G target gene and call, uh, uh, release the protein or translate to the protein now for that particular target gene. So the main, uh, the uh, critical event that occurs in that signaling is activation of transcription factors. For T cells, when we talk about T cell activation, our job, uh, so the, uh, our purpose is to see how the transcription factors that are important for that T cell uh, signaling are activated. And those transcription factors are AP1, NF-kappa-B, and NFAT. So those are the three transcription factors that have to be activated through some of these signaling pathways. So let's see how these three transcription factors are activated. Are you guys with me? All right. So here the, we are going to be talking about lots of new terminology and lots of new uh, names. So uh, we'll kind of revise it again and again. So let's talk about the signaling. So now the peptide and peptide MHC complex has interacted with TCR complex. And then the TCR complex and co-receptors cluster and they get that second signal, so the T cell gets activated. Once that T, cells, uh, T cell is activated, signaling begins. So where does the signaling be begin? It begins at LCK. Where was LCK? LCK was in the cytoplasmic tail of the core. Yeah, so core receptor. So, in, so, so say here is LCK in that signal. Now LCK is a kinase, so it's going to add phosphate to the items. Right in the to the tyrosine, LCK is a tyrosine kinase, so it adds phosphate to the tyrosine in the item. So here it's adding that phosphate. Once that's added, those phosphate moieties activate another molecule called ZAP70, and that ZAP70 again gets uh, interacts with another adapter molecule called LAT. So the three molecules that we need to remember is LCK, ZAP70, LAT. All right, so these are the signaling, that's the sequence of signaling that occurs. LCK, ZAP70, LAT. Once that signaling occurs, that part of the signaling occurs, LAT or LAT is a docking site. It's an adapter molecule. So it's a docking site for several other molecules or enzymes that can interact with that kind of, it's a surface where all those enzymes interact with each other. So 
I think that's the first phase of signaling that we talk about. And then because of that LAT uh, being used as a docking station, it helps to interact, uh, helps to initiate three different pathways that gives rise to three different transcription factors. There is a pathway called PLC gamma pathway that uh, gives rise to, uh, to transcription factor NF kappa B1 and NFAT. And then there is mitogen activated protein kinase pathway that um, helps in activation of EP1. So the end result of that interaction, all of that pathway, is to make sure that these three uh, transcription factors are activated. You guys with me? All right, so let's go back and talk again. Same thing. Lick is the first molecule in the co-receptor cytoplasmic tail to be activated. It's a CERC family kinase that adds phosphate to tyrosine. So Lick is going to add phosphate to the tyrosine in the items of these CD3 and zeta chains. Once that tyrosine is activated, um, sorry, phosphorylated, that's going to become a docking station for something called ZAP70. ZAP or zeta-associated protein. So it's a, a protein associated with zeta chain. That's all it means. So ZAP70 be, uh, phosphorylates LAT, and LAT becomes a docking station for several enzymes. To remember these three molecules, we just came up with a mnemonic. Basically, we are just calling it, say, a baby licks the floor, gets zapped. It's lying on the floor, so that's the lick zap 70 lat. So however it helps you remember those three signaling molecules, you just have to remember the sequence. First one is lick, then zap 70, and then lat. All right, moving along. So now we are going to talk about different uh, pathways after the uh, LAT is phosphorylated and becomes a docking station for different kinds of enzymes. So one of them is PLC gamma, and then the other one is MAP kinase pathway, right? Another pathway is the PI3 kinase pathway. So when that activation occurs, there is PI3 kinase. That's another enzyme that's activated, and that takes that is important for cell survival. So let's look at that pathway first. So PI3 kinase acts on something called FIP2. Again, it's a ki kinase, so it's going to add phosphate. So it adds a phosphate to FIP2 to make it FIP3. So it's phosphoenositol um, uh, diphosphate. So phosphate to dienositol biphosphate. So FIP2 is the one that gets activated by FIP a PI3 kinase to form PIP3, and PIP3 further activates PDK1, that activates AKT1, and sorry, AKT, and then AKT inactivates some of the apoptotic factors, like BCL2. Because the apoptotic factors are inactivated, the cell survives longer. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's our PI3 kinase pathway. Remember, PI3 kinase can be uh, defective and that can give rise to gain of function uh, defect in PI3 kinase and you know we see patients with those kinds of defects because of which the cell survival can be affected in those patients. <clears throat> All right so that was one pathway now we are going to talk about the second pathway so the initial uh, signaling is the same right LCK activates ZAP70, ZAP70 activates LAT LAT becomes a docking station for something called GRAB2SOS. GRAB2SOS activates RAS GDP and changes, converts it to RAS GTP. RAS pathway then goes through first two or three different steps to, uh, to give rise to transcription of CFOS. CFOS and CJUN are two factors that come together to form AP1. AP1 is our transcription factor that we need for, say, for the transcription of our target genes, say, IL-2. So we, for the MAP kinase pathway, we need two different factors to be activated or phosphorylated. CFOS transcription has to occur, and CJUN has to be phosphorylated. CJUN and CFOS together form AP1. So 
after LAT is activated, it becomes a docking station for GRAB2 SOS that activates RAS pathway, RAS GTP pathway, that gives rise to transcription of CFOS. And then the second part is where the, this part's not shown here. LAT becomes, uh, or LAT, becomes a docking station for something called RAS, and that activates RAC GTP. Instead of RAS GTP, RAC GTP, and RAC GTP um, activates junk, or uh, C-June N-terminal kinase, or junk, and activated junk phosphorylates C-June. So RAC, junk, June. And here, RAS, ERK, ELK, and then CFOS. So I don't think you, you know, yes, you need to know that some of these terms, but I would concentrate on uh, um, memorizing LIC, ZAP70, LAT, RAP2, SOS, RAS, GTP. That gives rise to CFOS. And then LIC, ZAP70, LAT activates, becomes a docking station for VAV. That activates RAC and gives rise to C-June. C-June and CFOS come together to form our transcription factor AP1, and that can then uh, help in modulating transcription of, say, IL-2. <clears throat> and IL-2 is just an example. It can be any cytokine that needs to be released, but that's the prototype that we're going to talk about that helps with this uh, differentiation of T-cells. Now we go back to the so that was second pathway. We talked about PI3 kinase pathway, and we talked about MAP kinase pathway. <coughs> now we talk about the next pathway, which is PLC gamma pathway. So the initial phase, initial signaling is the same. TCR and antigen uh, interacted. Co-receptor took, uh, took part in that interaction. LC, it, the whole got co-stimulated, and the T cell got activated. LCK phosphorylates the I time in zeta chain. Zeta chain becomes a docking station for ZAP70. ZAP70 activates LAT or phosphorylates LAT. LAT becomes a docking station for other molecules, something like uh, ITK and PLC gamma. ITK also helps in interacting with PLC gamma 1. PLC gamma 1 is an enzyme that um, gives rise to uh, two molecules from PIP2. PIP2 is, um, uh, with the help of the PLC gamma 2, forms DAG and IP3, or DAG and IP3. So DAG give, interacts with an enzyme called PKC, or protein kinase C, and activates the transcription factor NF-kappa B. And then IP3, through some signaling molecules, uh, activates NFAT transcription factor. So let's talk about these two pathways. So IP3, so again, let's talk about LAT phosphorylating, uh, helping as a docking station for, for enzyme PLC gamma 1. PLC gamma 1 is going to uh, interact with PIP2 to produce DAG and IP3. This IP3 causes release of calcium from the intracellular calcium stores. Because the calcium from these intracellular stores is released into the cytoplasm, there is a protein called STEM1 in the endoplasmic reticulum from where the calcium was released. That STEM is just a sensor of calcium in the intracellular stores. So now STEM1 is look is sensing that the calcium has reduced. So now it wants to get back the calcium that it needs, so it's going to interact with an extracellular calcium channel called crack. So it's a crack channel that it interacts with. Crack channel has a protein called ORI in, in its structure. Crack channel, when it opens up because of that interaction with STEM1, causes release of calcium from extracellular space inside the cell. So it again increasing the cytoplasmic calcium. So initially the calcium that was in the cytoplasm was coming from the endoplasmic reticulum. Once that's increased, STEM1 causes more uh, 
more of calcium coming into the cell by opening up this crack channel. Now there is increased calcium in here and that causes, uh, it, I'm going to go to the next page. All right, so here there is calcium that's increased in the cytoplasm that interacts with a molecule called calmodulin. Calcium calmodulin interacts with something called calcineurin phosphatase. So calcineurin takes phosphatase, so it takes away a phosphate from NFAT. So there is NFAT sitting in the cytoplasm. It's in an inactive stage because it has phosphate attached to it. Because this, this calcineurin phosphatase uh, takes away the phosphate from the NFAT, it's activated. So dephosphorylated form of NFAT is active. So once that active NFAT is formed, it's going to go into the nucleus and then help with transcription of IL-2. So um, calcium is increased by that IP3. IP3 initiates that increase in calcium in the cytoplasm. Then there are other proteins like STEM1, CRAC, and ORI that take part in that increase in calcium level in the cytoplasm. Once that increases, calcium interacts with the forms a complex called calcium calmodulin that helps to activate calcineurin, and calcineurin phosphatase activates NFAT. So guess what we use in our practice as calcineurin inhibitors? Cyclosporin and tacrolimus. So cyclosporin and tacrolimus forms complex with some other proteins or binding proteins that help to inhibit calcineurin. So in effect, they, uh, inact they keep NFAT in their inactive stage. So help they help with immunosuppression of what, with T cells, right? So this is the mechanism behind their action. All right. So we talked about all three pathways. Let's go back to this slide. So we talked about how PLC gamma is activated. Once PLC gamma is activated, it, uh, it forms DAG and IP3. We talked about how, how IP3 helps with activation of NFAT transcription factor. And this, the second molecule that the uh, PLC gamma one formed was DAG. And that DAG um, is the one that interacts with PKC. In case of T cells, it's called PKC theta. And so PKC theta is the one that uh, activates NF-kappa B pathway, right? We'll talk about the NF-kappa B pathway in a little bit, but we'll stop here. But in effect, we talked about four things. We talked about, or five things. We talked about uh, PI3 kinase helping with cell survival. Then we talked about two MAP kinase pathways, RAS and RAC, that gave rise to CFOS and C-June. Together they formed AP1. And then the third one is PLC gamma 1 pathway. PLC gamma 1 is in T cells. PLC gamma 2 is in B cells. So PLC gamma 1 gives rise to IP3 and DAG. IP3 activates NFAT. DAG activates NF-kappa B. Simple, see? <laughs> okay. You got it? No. Okay. Where can we go back? Okay. I think we can just kind of recollect the whole thing and just make sure that you remember all these names. So LIC, ZAP70, LAT, okay? LIC, ZAP70, and LAT, once they interact with each other, so they are basically just adding phosphate to the molecules. Once the phosphate is added, ZAP70 needs these two phosphates together so they can, ZAP70 can be activated. ZAP70 then adds phosphate to LAT. LAT becomes a docking station for PLC gamma, grab to SOS and wow. Grab to SOS helps with RAS GTP, wow helps with RAS GTP, and PLC gamma 1 gives rise to IP3 and DAG. That's our AP1 and then NF kappa B and, and NFAT pathways right there. So right here is you can see you are not you cannot see the wow here but grab to SOS and wow give rise to RAS and RAC, CFOS and CJUN that forms that MAP kinase pathways give rise to AP1. And then the second one is PLC gamma 1. PLC gamma 1 gives rise to IP3 DAG 
and those two help with NFAT and, and, and NSCAPA B. Final pathway where all three, AP1 and NFAT and NSCAPA B, come to the nucleus, interact with that uh, gene, and activate IL-2 gene, help with transcription with IL-2 mRNA, and then translate to IL-2 formation, right? Production of IL-2. But then that, that activation has to be regulated, so there are several proteins in place for regulation of that. One of them are non-coding RNAs. So there are long non-coding RNAs and micro RNAs, and they don't form any proteins they just interact with mRNA to regulate the f uh, production of proteins. Um, that's how my microRNAs are formed. They initially are primary transcripts that are acted on tro by drosha, and the drosha cuts that transcript into pre-microRNA, and then dicer acts on it to form the final microRNA. And then microRNA interacts with the mRNA and uh, some other proteins to give rise to complexes that help in regulating protein for production. There are phosphatases, just like there are tyrosine kinases, there are phosphatases that take part in signaling that help, and then there is, so they are called SHIP1 and SHIP2 that are phosphatases that take away tyrosine from the, uh, sorry, take away the phosphate from the, where the tyrosines are uh, phosphorylated, and SHIP is specifically for PI3 kinase. So SHP1, SHP2, and SHIP are phosphatases that take away phosphates from the activated molecules that way they deactivate the T cells. There is another phosphatase called CD45. CD45 is in all hematopoietic cells. And they have a role on activation. Instead of deactivation, they help with activation of LIC. Um, and I'll show you that figure. Then there are some molecules called from CD2 family. The CD2 family, uh, CD2 itself binds to, uh, uh, to some integrins and helps with adhesion as well as signaling. There are two other molecules called SLAM and 2B4 that have some, not ITAM, not ITIM, it has a switch motif. So immunoreceptor tyrosine switch motif, which means here's the structure for that, right? Here, the switch motif, when it, there is presence of a protein called SLAM-associated protein or SAP, that motif, instead of being an inhibitory motif, turns to an activating motif. So it can switch from inhibitory to activation, activation and that's the reason it's called a switch motif. So it's called ITSM. Okay. So that, uh, so the defect in SAP protein gives rise to X-linked lymphoproliferative syndrome. And this is the gene that codes for SAP. Similarly, another CD2 pro, uh, family protein, uh, sorry, molecule called 2B4 also has that switch motif. So that's the regulation of T cells. Here's CD45. So CD45 is a phosphatase. Here is our lick. LIC is bound to the cytoplasmic tail of CD4 or CD8. LIC is actually phosphorylated, and because it's phosphorylated, it's actually inactive. So that's in presence of something called CSK or kinase. The kinase keeps this part, this uh, pink thing, is the phosphate. Because it's, a kinase acts on the inactive LCK, there is a phosphate attached to it, so it's in inactive stage. How do we know? There is this linker, mole, linker protein here that is firmly grabbed on by SH3 molecule in that LCK, and that keeps it inactivated. When CD45 dephosphorylates, which means takes away the phosphate from here, right? when it takes it away, that linker molecule is released, and that activates the LCK. Now that it's activated, it can phosphorylate zeta chain. Right? So when the T cell is activated, CD45 is the one that activates LCK. This is from Janeway, by the way. This is not from Abbas, because Abbas doesn't have this kind of a figure. So I, just, I thought this was really helpful from Janeway. All right. What are the other changes that occur with T cell activation? 
there are some metabolic changes. So in inactive or resting stage, T cells undergo oxidative phosphorylation and produce a lot of energy. When these are activated, they undergo aerobic glycolysis. So there is very less amount of energy that's produced, but in turn, they uh, preserve some of the building blocks that are needed for biosynthesis of organelles. That helps with proliferation of T cells. That's another change. That's it for T cell activation and signaling. Now let's talk about B cell signaling. It's pretty similar, but we just need to point out some of the differences. The same thing, BCR interacts with the antigen, and then the signaling molecules are Ig beta and Ig alpha that have ITAM on the cytoplasmic tail. The core receptor that for the BCR is called CR2 or CD21. So it's a complement receptor 2, also has the CD molecule name called CD21. So CD21, CD19, CD81 is the core receptor complex. This CR2 binds to a fragment called C3D. So remember C3, complement uh, fragment C3, cleaves into C3A and C3B. C3B has a fragment that's still attached to the antigen that's called C3D. That C3D has, is a, can be bound to this core receptor. So this acts as a receptor for the ligand C3D. Now that's attached to the antigen, so that's how the antigen interacts with the BCR, and the C3D part of it is going to be attached to the CR2 or CD21. Sorry. So that's how the BCR and the core receptor interacts with the antigen. Once it interacts with it, it can activate similar, it can go through similar signaling process to activate the signaling uh, chains, I, Ig alpha and beta. So similar to LIC, there is a CERC family kinase called LIN in B cells. So here the LIN is phosphorylated, that's, uh, that's attached to the core receptor. Once it's phosphorylated, it phosphorylates the Ig beta, and then SIC is our ZAP70 for B cells. So instead of LIC ZAP70, it's LIN SIC. LIN SIC, and then once that ZAP70 or SIC is, in, uh, is activated, it gives rise to further activation of different enzymes. So let's look at that. So instead of LAT, there is a cytoplasmic adapter molecule called SLIP65 here. So LIN, where's LIN? Here, LIN, SIC, SLIP65 is our sequence for B cells. And similar to ITK, there is BTK in B cells. And we know BTK, right? If the BTK is defective, what do you get? Brutens. Brutens A gamma globulinemia. So there is no um, maturation of B cells if this molecule is missing. So lin sick, SLIP65 and BTK, that helps, that's a docking station, so it interacts with various enzymes. One is PI3 kinase. PI3 kinase is the same. It helps with cell survival. And then it also acts as a docking station for PLC gamma. PLC gamma activation gives rise to IP3 and DAG. IP3 activates NFAT, DAG, through PKC beta now, not theta. PKC theta was T cell, PKC beta will activate NF kappa B, and then SLIP65 acts as a station <coughs> for same thing, grab 2 SOS and wow, and go through RAS GTP and RAC GTP, ERK or junk, and CFOS and CJUN. CFOS and CJUN together form a, uh, uh, AP1. So the rest of this part is the same. It's just these initial molecules that are different for B cells. The SLIP65 also has another name called BLINK, and BLINK defect is also causes, just like BTK, it can cause uh, A gamma globulinemia, but it's autosomal recessive. BTK is X-linked. Okay. So SLIP65 or BLINK, thick BLINK, B, uh, Blink and BTK. And the first one is LIN. So LIN, SIC, Blink, and then BTK. For T cells, it was LIC, ZAP70, LAT, and ITK. Okay? 
All right, attenuation, basically there are lots of inhibitory receptors. Instead of items, they have items, so inhibitory motifs on their uh, cytoplasmic tail. So that helps. Some of these are mentioned here. Um, and then there is attenuation of immune receptor signaling because once it's activated, these activating molecules will keep attaching to those items like ZAP70. So they have to be ubiquinated. Ubiquination means they are tagged for degradation. Okay, that's all it means. So there is a molecule called CBLB that, that tags the ZAP70, so ZAP70 is then taken to lysosome and degraded. All right, that's, that's all for T cell and B cell signaling. Now we talk about cytokine receptors. There are different types, type 1, type 2. There are other receptor families like TNF, IL-1, IL-17, GPCR. So these are different uh, cytokine families. Important for type 1 and type 2, they co go through signaling called jack stack pathway. Type 1 cytokines are three different groups, subunits, common gamma chain, common beta chain, and common GP130 chain. So you have to memorize the cytokines that are definitely memorize the gamma chain. If you can remember the others, that's fine. So for common gamma chain, 2, 4, 7, 9, 15, 21. That should be memorized like anything. Write down, do whatever you want, make, make, you know, make a pattern, but remember 2, 4, 7, 9, 15, 21. Um, common gamma chain, what, what defect in that causes? X-linked skin. X-linked skin. And defect in Jack can also, Jack, uh, can also cause X-linked gene, so, uh, skin. So, so because that's downstream of the common gamma chain, that can be uh, cause skin. It's not X-linked, but it's uh, skin. Type 2 are our interferons, IL-10 and IL-22, TNF receptor family, lots of different uh, molecules there. And then IL-1 and IL-18 are in the IL-1 uh, sorry, family. There is IL-17 family, and then there are other uh, immune receptors. TNF receptors. So here are the signaling. So there are lots of receptors in this family. They are trimers. Trimers, remember the TLRs were dimers? TNF are trimers. They have to interact with some trimer, like TNF, right? They interact with their ligand, which is a trimer as well. And because of that, those trimer receptor ligand interactions, there are adapter molecules. And instead of kinases, there are other kinds of <coughs> enzymes that might be taking part in this. So there are molecules called TRAD. TRAD interacts with TRAS, and they have E3 ligase activity that activates some of these molecules. So NF-kappa-B, um, AP1, and caspase. Caspase leads to apoptosis. So TNF receptors can lead to, some of them can lead to apoptosis. And then the NF-kappa-B and AP1 are similar. They help with gene transcription. Questions about that? All right, jack stat pathway. So cytokines, say IL-2 uh, IL receptor, right? Once it interacts with IL-2, the cytokine, there is signaling that occurs uh, downstream of that. There are two molecules of JAK that it's a kinase, right? JAK is a kinase, so genus kinase. So basically that adds phosphate moiety to something called STAT. And that causes a dimer of those two STATs that it interacts with, and that dimer of stat molecules goes to the nucleus, interacts with the promoter region of uh, specific target genes, and cause, um, modulates the transcription of those genes. So jack stat pathway is basically jack interacting with stat molecules, causes dimerization of stat and uh, activation of stat. What's stat? Signal transducer and activator of transcription. There are different types of stats, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5A, 5B, and 6. So there are seven stats. There are only four JAK. Janus kinase are JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and TIC2. The fourth one is just named differently. <laughs> just to make it more fun, right? So yeah, all right. Now here, this is the signaling. To regulate this signaling, there are some molecules, just like SHP1, SHP2, there are something called SOCs or suppressors of cytokine signaling that help in interaction with that. And there are protein inhibitors of STAT, or PIAS, that help regulate uh, this signaling. 
And the last one is NF-kappa B signaling. So NF-kappa B, we talked about that. It's one of the transcription factors for T cells or B cells. But it's actually downstream of lots of different uh, enzymes, or, sorry, receptors, like TNF receptors, TLR receptors, TCR, VCR. So it's a very common pathway for several different receptors that takes, takes part. So here, there are two types of pathways, canonical and non-canonical pathway. And the end goal is to have this NF-kappa B activated. So NF-kappa B is this two small beige-colored molecules. They are attached to their inhibitor in the cytoplasm in inactive stage. It's called inhibitor of kappa B, right? So IKB. IK, this inhibitor attached to the inactivated NF-kappa B can only be released when it's acted on by a kinase called I-kappa B kinase, IKK. It's a complex. Once this kinase takes, adds phosphate to this inactivator or inhibitor, it's ubiquinated, so it's, you, uh, it's ubiquinated for degradation, so that was the inhibitor. So because it gets degraded, that inactivated NF-kappa B is released that goes to the nucleus and helps with gene transcription. So in simplest form, NF-kappa B is in uh, inactive phase, stage because it's attached to its inhibitor. That inhibitor has to be phosphorylated for it to be the phos so that it's released from NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B, because it's released, it gets activated and goes to the nucleus. Got it? That was the simplest form. Now, the important part is the, the kinase that phosphorylates the inhibitor. That kinase has three parts, alpha, beta, and gamma. Gamma is also called NEMO, and NEMO is the one that, if it's defective, can cause um, immunodeficiency or NEMO defect. Some of the other ones can also cause immunodeficiencies, innate, innate immunodeficiencies. So IKK alpha, beta, and gamma together form the kinase complex that phosphorylates the inhibitor. Once it's phosphorylated, it gets released, and NF-kappa B is released and activated and goes to the nucleus. That's it. Each of the following is a, an example of GPCR. Uh, e. E, chemokine receptor CCR7. And then in T cell signaling, calcium signaling pathway induced by antigen receptor recognition, which enzyme and transcription factor are activated? Calcium, urine, and end fat. So calcium, yeah, activates the calcium calmodulin yeah. um, activation of calcium urine phosphatase that dephosphorylates end fat to the active form of end fat. All right, that's it.